Okay. Okay, continue. Alba Griffin is one of the authors and just joined. Oh, Magali, no te reconocí, Dios mío, yo estaba mirando a otro lado. Hola, Magali, ¿cómo estás? Hola, muy bien, ¿cómo estás, Zoila? Gusto de verte. Te estaba acostumbrada a verte con el pelo largo siempre. Pues aquí está. Sí. Lo corté, pero volvió a crecer. Sí. ¿Cómo has estado? Bien, sobreviviendo como todos, felizmente. Eso. Sí. Bien, yo acá en el sótano de mi casa, que es el único espacio donde puedo estar Tranquila. lejos de las niñas, sí. ¿Tiene dos, dos niñas? Sí, dos niñas, de un año y siete años, así que muy uh, ruidosa la casa. Estás distraída, entonces Eso. tienes mucha distracción. Okay, vamos a, voy a ponerme mute para no fastidiar. Hola. Amazing. So I'll wait another minute or so and we can start. Hi, Mike. Yeah. Let me see the chat. <clears> okay, <throat> hey, I think we will begin. Uh, I want to welcome everyone. And, and I know we have people, uh, I've just gotten a couple of texts, people are be here in five minutes, 10 minutes. One person said, go, go ahead without me, which we would have done anyway. But anyway, I want to uh, thank you all for attending. This is the first of a series of book presentations that we sponsor with our dear friends at the Center for Latin American Studies, the Bolivar House at Stanford University, and I want to thank them. I also want to thank and acknowledge the help from UC Davis Global Affairs, particularly or specifically of Adrian Batasca, who's in charge of the technical elements here and is, is running the Zoom. Um, and I also want to mention the Hemispheric Institute in the Americas. This is the first of, of two events. When we have the poster up, you'll see the, the next book discussion um, on December 2nd with um, Lisa, uh, Lina Brito in her book on Colombia and its role in the, in the drug war um, in Colombia. It's a fascinating book that, and, and I really recommend you to join us. So today we're going to talk about Patricio Liart's new edited volume, Pedagogías de la Decidencia en América Latina. And it's a book that is freely distributed. We were just talking about that by La Siniestra en Lima. It is downloadable and free, we, so we strongly recommend. I know that many people here have been commenting on it already. It, it's an astonishing, uh, very important series of essays. It began in a, with a conference, or Patricia mentions a prior conference, which I just love the name of. It's, it was called Pedagogy Singular of the Oppressed in Time of the Emergence of the Emancipated Spectator. And it's, it's a series of uh, chapters on cultural appropriation, activismo cultural in the, in the 21st century. And it's a, it's a very important theoretical, methodological overview of the changes in fields as far as pedagogy, pedagogy of the oppressed, Freire's famous term, also um, new social movements or new, new social movements. And the chapters themselves, the spaces they talk about are, are very are, are fascinating and very important in themselves. These include rethinking racism, jails, the classroom, uh, radio, Quechua in indigenous language re revitalization, and the internet. There's a series of essays, I recommend them strongly. I know it's already had a strong impact um, in England, in Peru, I've seen quite a bit about it. So I'm gonna leave it to our two presenters today. First, Patricia Oliart will, will give us a presentation about the book. We'll speak for about 15 minutes or so. She's a senior lecturer in Latin American studies and the head of Spanish, Portuguese, and Latin American studies at Newcastle University in the UK. Um, and commenting will be Magali Rabasa, who is an assistant professor at Lewis and Clark 
College and a alum of UC Davis. So I want to thank both of them and I want to thank you all for that. We will have time at the end for questions. The best format we think is chat. So if you could just send them in, I will moderate them and include them. So Patricia, uh, Patricia adelante. Yes. Well, thank you so much, uh, Chuck, for this um, idea. I really feel very fortunate to be able to discuss the, the book. Um, and um, I'll start by uh, telling the, the story of the book. I was um, in my previous research cycle uh, working on education, development, indigenous um, peoples. Um, and then uh, in the last uh, decade, um, when I first joined Facebook in, in 2009, and with all the different um, social movements that started to emerge, I started noticing a very fresh, intelligent uh, language among people working in, in cultural activism. And that uh, was very interesting to me and very close to my personal experience. Um, I used to sing when I was in university and I was what we could call now a cultural activist. I had um, um, theater and music workshops in shanty towns in Lima and I sang in big rallies with my, <laughs> my band, etc. And from those years, I had a very uh, critical view on the ways in which people did uh, political cultural work sometimes in a way that i found um, insulting uh, for the audiences um, and at, at any uh, um, great distance from what they understood as, as culture and um, I took, in that sense, uh, a sort of a Ramsian position <laughs> uh, together with other people um, and tried to do things differently, being aware of this uh, kind of vertical approach, uh, teaching people how to do things. And when I uh, noticed this transformation um, and this different way of um, dealing with the practices of politics and uh, cultural activism, I got really interested into it. And first, it was a personal interest and curiosity and kind of a celebration, <laughs> celebratory uh, spirit looking at that. And then I started reading more and uh, the kind of work that other people were doing about the, the emergence of these practices. And this is um, how it all started. I uh, uh, came across Jacques Rancière that I hadn't, uh, read before and uh, his um, um, understanding of cultural work and pedagogies that are involved in in the arts um, and what it means in terms of the possibility of establishing egalitarian relationships with the audiences um, was very uh, interesting and motivating and then I of course um, um, relied on my knowledge of um, Educación Popular, which is uh, something that I also practiced and was uh, involved in many debates uh, when I was doing this uh, cultural activism in Peru um, in the late uh, 70s, early 80s. And so I thought uh, that it was a, an interesting idea to put these two perspectives in conversation, because in, in a way uh, there are a lot of um, similarities in the approach. And this is why I thought of this event, um, you know, pedagogies of the pedagogy of the oppressed in times of the emancipated spectator, um, thinking in how these different uh, groups of activists um, um, interpolated their audiences in a playful way, um, trying to provide more the experience that allowed people to live in a different way, to establish a different relations with people, um, and to affirm um, new values. And this is how um, uh, it all started. And then uh, if we could see the table of, of contents, I can walk you through the through the book, um, I uh, wrote an introduction that allowed me to go into a very important thing um, that I consider needs to be done. And this is to historicize uh, 
the transformation in the approaches and how uh, history and politics provide different layers of contents that um, everybody is exposed to. And so you can see how without much um, theoretical debate, <laughs> uh, people produce uh, art forms or intervene in society to transform society by generating new subjectivities, including a very complex agenda that has developed um, in the past uh, decades. And so um, I wanted to write an introduction that allowed to see these transformations and these uh, layering of um, understandings, perspectives, but also uh, positionalities in, in society because um, we are much more complex than we were before and due to the very action of different social movements there are more uh, spaces of um, enunciation and more opportunities for people to debate um, on their own subjectivities, for instance, with the emergence of feminism uh, or with the um, growth of uh, anti-racism in many cases coming from the state, the same as feminism. No? So this type of intervention that also have an echo in society are elements that form part of the discourses and practices of these uh, new, we could say, cultural activism. And um, so um, when we had this uh, first uh, meeting and also through um, work I do as a PhD supervisor and um, just a colleague gathering people, I also organized other events and conferences where I met uh, the different authors. I um, um, invited a few of them to, to come together with experiences that I thought could bring uh, the, the book together with all this range of experiences. And I also tried to be very uh, open regarding the, um, um, the moment in the careers of the authors and also the, the things that they, they do. Um, and so, um, there is also a diversity in the in nature of the work the others do, but also in what they uh, do. So um, I organized the book in a chronological uh, way. Um, and we have first uh, uh, a chapter about Pedro Lemebel and a radio program he had um, in Radio Tierra, a feminist um, radio station. And the chapter examines um, the kind of um, description that he does himself as uh, one of these uh, activists who in his practice uh, teaches people certain things. And he's a very um, um, aware of autocritico, <laughs> no? uh, his perspective on, on his own practice and acknowledging the moments when he fails to engage uh, his audiences in certain things. No? For example, he tells how a guy in prison tells him that he was cool except when he criticized Don Francisco, no? for example. And um, so um, then there is another chapter where um, the um, uh, a group of colleagues in, in Chile, um, in um, the um, uh, University of Chile, um, who are also activists, um, tell us uh, the story in the form of a systematization, uh, very common among um, young social scientists, but also NGOs doing work in communities. So this is a, a, a different chapter, we could say, um, in relation to the others. They are telling us uh, their reflections, their motivations, um, and the results of an intervention in a young offenders uh, um, establishment. Um, and the um, option the educators had to break, um, even in this context, um, the um, authoritarianism in, the, um, in this total, you could say, institution. Uh, but also using the loopholes that the um, 
variations in the Chilean laws regarding youth offenders uh, had had during the alternative uh, alternating regimes, and so they. The, they play with the loopholes within the law to be able to enter the prisons with this kind of activity. No? And then we have an, a great article by uh, Virginia Zavala that she led me for the book. It had already been published in English, but it fitted perfectly with what I wanted to do with the book about how the practice of young Peruvians who embrace the Quechua identity, even if they are, they are not native speakers of Quechua, um, uh, interpolate the, the state policies of bilingual education or the, the understanding, the political understanding of bilingualism in contemporary Peru, establishing other forms of um, engaging with the language uh, by an affirmation of the identity of these uh, young people. And then um, from another um, um, experience uh, combining Peru and Argentina, um, Agustina Triquel, a photographer and uh, um, social scientist from Argentina, and me who had been uh, working with photography collectives exploring these different expressions and forms of inter uh, intervening in culture, uh, we decided to write this together to um, show the wide range of possibilities of um, assuming an anti-racist um, point of view as an artist. And so we uh, analyzed the particular circumstances um, in Cordoba in Argentina and Lima in Peru and the work of an individual photographer in Peru but who belongs to a photography collective and a collective of photographers and activists in, in Argentina. And um, then uh, Mark Biram was my, my student in um, uh, an MA in Latin American studies. And he was very interested in the Piqueteros movement, but also in the Bachillerato Populares that emerged out of this experience. And he went to conduct a short uh, field work um, with an anarchist uh, Bachillerato Popular in Mar del Plata. And this uh, chapter is the result of this ethnography and the way in which they negotiated their curriculum, but also their own ways of um, understanding self-education. And then uh, Alba Griffin's uh, chapter is a, a very um, um, deep, we could say, reconstruction of what Alba calls um, uh, vernacular theorizations of um, violence in everyday life in, in Colombia. And um, uh, what she does is to study uh, the memorialization of a bridge um, where the gra uh, graffiti artists give their own um, interpretation of a violent event you know, uh, to create uh, a memorial, a place for memory in, in that place. So as, as you can see, it's a wide range of experiences, but I wanted to show them, um, and with this I, I finish, um, joining uh, Boaventura de Sosa Santos and his idea of um, um, uh, creating a, a sociology that acknowledges the emergence of new phenomena um, and as a way of fighting what he calls the sociology of waste uh, because uh, sometimes by criticizing how something is similar uh, or close or far from uh, what should be really transformative or, or politically relevant etc uh, if they don't meet these criteria these uh, expressions are discarded and uh, that doesn't help. <laughs> so um, the book has this, this aim of collecting um, different writing styles, different approaches to politics and the arts and cultural interventions to show this uh, variety. Um, right. Is that, thank you. Yes. Okay. 
All right. Um, well, thank you so much, Patricia, and felicidades. This is a fantastic book, and it's so wonderful to have it so readily available to all of us. Um, I first wanted to just say how thrilled I am to be here uh, with one of our virtual here's being here at UC Davis, which was a really important intellectual home for me while I was doing my doctoral work at UC Davis. Um, big thank you to Patricia, Chuck, and Alberto for the invitation to participate in this inaugural conversation for what promises to be a really exciting series. Um, I also really want to thank all of the workers who are making this event possible because I think right now with the distanced format of so much of our experience, workers who are already invisible are even more invisible. Um, so I just really want to recognize those who are making this possible. Um, Patricia and I were introduced uh, many years ago over email, but have yet to have the chance to even have this kind of uh, interaction. So I'm really thrilled also for this. Um, so there's an urgency to this book that was no doubt a part of what brought it to life. But I think today that that urgency is really amplified by the need to think and act creatively and collectively in new ways. Um, I've organized my comments today around two sets of ideas. The first about the sort of conceptual contributions of the book, and the second really focused on its methodological contributions. So with the concept of pedagogies of dissent, Oliert and her contributors offer insights into thinking about the shifting role of cultural practice and cultural production in political struggles for liberation in the Americas. In her introduction, she identifies this tension, which she talked about just now, this historicization that she does um, with this, this tension that emerges at the turn of the 21st century, where we see two approaches to cultural activism or cultural resistance. The first being identified with the 20th century legacy of culture as a vehicle for the transmission of the politics of liberation. And this is that all too familiar tendency of cultural production and political education being a vehicle for the explicatory and denunciatory communication that comes from that self-appointed vanguard. Um, but as Rancière, who uh, Patricia mentioned, and who she cites as well, uh, insists, this is really a deeply anti-democratic use of culture and education. Um, in my own work, I, and I'm not gonna talk about my own work for more than just 12 seconds here, I promise. Um, in my own work, I, I work closely with uh, networks of alternative presses, alternative publishing houses um, in Latin America that are really closely accompanying uh, autonomous movements. And these are the publishing projects that are producing and circulating grassroots theory of current movements and organizations. Uh, and it comes as no surprise that in these spaces, Rancière's The Ignorant Schoolmaster is a frequently re-edited sort of classic, right? It's a bestseller at the book fairs that I study. Um, and I mention this not, not just because of the Rancière connection, but also because the spaces where those works are circulating um, and the events where those works are circulating, where those works are, are, are being brought to life um, are a clear expression of this second approach to cultural re resistance that Patricia identifies in this introduction and, and across the work. So she describes a sort of opening in the 21st century where movements imagine culture in itself as an experience of liberation. Here, the production of culture, cultural events and spaces all of what we might think of as the practices of culture are experiences that can facilitate that formation of the new subjectivities that are then uh, sort of mobilizers of transformation. So rather than an emphasis on culture as a tool for the representation of liberation or culture as a vehicle for the communication of a politics of liberation that already exists somewhere, in this view, the emphasis is on those practices and those processes as potentially liberatory in themselves. Her conceptualization of pedagogies of dissent offers a really important vocabulary for thinking about emerging formations of culture and politics for which we may not already have analytical frameworks. She references, as she did in her comments just now, Boaventura de Sousa Santos' notion of that sociology of the emergent. And I think what she develops here, and this is my own bias perhaps, is something like a cultural studies of the emergent. The concept of pedagogies of dissent, of course, draws on Freire's theory of the pedagogy of the oppressed, and as she reminds us, the pedagogy of the press was also once called a pedagogy of liberation. And I think that that is a significant uh, reminder. Crucially, she foregrounds the fact that the Freirean concept of pedagogy is fundamentally centered around that production of political subjectivities. And I think that it's easy to lose that when we think pedagogy, right? But thinking that what is at stake is that production of subjectivities, a continual production of subjectivities. By naming cultural activism and cultural resistance a pedagogical practice, She's insisting on the fact that what culture does here is facilitate the production of those subjectivities and of new social relations. So it's not just those individual subjectivities, but those collective relations that connect them. And this is all anchored in a collective horizon of liberation from all forms of domination, exclusion, and exploitation. 
In this view of pedagogies and of culture, social relations are continually being produced and reimagined through that collective experience. Freire's pedagogy of the oppressed, and by extension, these pedagogies of dissent are participatory, experiential, reflexive, but also reflective. Uh, they're practices of collective learning and of collective action, and it's that connection that is really central. Content and meaning is not given, but rather co-created and, crucially, emergent. The hierarchies and boundaries that typically separate those who think from those who act, those who speak from those who listen, those who create ideas from those who act on them, are blurred in these processes and productively destabilized. So these pedagogies can be thought of as creating a space for non-hierarchical social relations or less hierarchical in aspiration at least, um, but also for that de-hierarchization, de the word I write and say all the time, yet I always stumble over it, <laughs> the de-hierarchization of the dynamics that shape knowledge and cultural practices. So again, those hierarchies that privilege the intellectual over the manual, the public over the private, et cetera. The book also offers us a new way to think about prefigurative politics by arguing that these pedagogies of dissent enact a cultural activism through which those collective experiences and processes are a catalyst for both critique of existing social relations and the proposal of other ways of being. What's especially significant is precisely the attention to the aesthetic dimension of prefiguration. And this is where we come back to the notion of pedagogies of liberation as spaces for creation of meaning rather than simply for reception or integration of some pre-existing meaning. The emphasis on aesthetics that these contributions offer suggests the need for new modes of analysis that re-articulate the political and the aesthetic to see the ways that they are dialogically connected. So we might ask, what is the materiality of prefiguration? What does it look like, sound like, feel like? How does it move? How does it travel? The projects and experiences that appear in this volume all emphasize practice and process in addition to, and I would say even over, product or any sense of fixed content. So it could be said that this way of thinking about cultural pro production and process uh, places the form, which is in a sense, the, uh, the form is in a sense rather the content. It's something like uh, Marshall McLuhan's famous assertion that the medium is the message, right? So we're really thinking about that form as integral to meaning. And when I say the form here, I'm referring to the aesthetics, but also to the process, right? Aesthetics often, uh, we think of the product only, but we need to think about the form of the process of production, of dissemination, of circulation. This attention to aesthetics and process provides a really exciting way to connect what we might think of as a radical contextualist approach. Again, I'm speaking from my cultural studies training here. Uh, so that radical contextualist approach to thinking about culture how we might be connecting that with a prefigurative approach to politics. In Patricia's co-authored chapter uh, with Agustina Triquel, for example, they examine these distinct but nonetheless related photography projects in Cordoba and Lima, which she mentioned. And they examine how this medium works to generate anti-racist subjectivities by prompting reflection about representation at an individual but also a collective level. And I, I wanna highlight this particular chapter because this comparative study does at a smaller, more focused scale, what the book overall does in terms of, as she says, poner de relieve or to bring to the surface, right? To highlight a common horizon of imagination and practice that connects these and other experiences of cultural resistance. So now shifting to talk a bit about the methodological contributions. The six chapters that follow the introduction tell stories, as we've heard, of cultural resistance in Chile, Colombia, Peru, and Argentina, exploring media forms that include graffiti, radio, photography, literature, and video produced by a really diverse range of social actors and across a considerable period of time as well. But there are implicit and explicit dialogues present between them that I think are really important. And these are transnational dialogues that cross borders, but also transhistorical dialogues that articulate these diverse experiences through shared historical references in some cases that at many points might be implicit references. There's also something participatory about all of the contributions to this volume that in a way echoes the participatory nature of pedagogies of liberation and dissent. Some do this explicitly so, as they're described as enacting participatory methodologies. The chapter, for example, on the intervention in the uh, youth um, 
uh, detention center in Chile, if I'm not mistaken, yes, in Chile, uh, that chapter in particular, as Patricia mentioned, really lays out that participatory dimension. But others do it more implicitly as the authors position themselves as indirect participants in the production of the meaning about the cultural production that they're examining. So they're situating themselves as part of that ongoing production of meaning. Beyond the fascinating and compelling stories of cultural resistance that appear in the individual chapters, I think that this collection is especially important because of its networking effect. By connecting these apparently disconnected experiences, Patricia makes visible something that's happening across the region in a dispersed and decentralized, but also resonant and networked manner. The book can be read like the beginnings of an incomplete or emerging map a map where others engaging in or witnessing similar or related practices might recognize those tendencies and the commonality that exists amidst that difference. This dimension of the project highlights an important role that researchers can play in the context of cultural resistance, documenting, highlighting, analyzing, and especially connecting. And in this case, as an edited collection and not a monograph, there's a sort of work of making connections among the various previously at least partially disconnected experiences that are represented in each chapter. So here I really want to highlight that Patricia's role as editor and not only as author is very significant. At the end of the introduction, she identifies a potential limitation, what she calls the problematic dimension of the kinds of experiences recounted in the book. And she alludes to their fragility and their vulnerability to both critique and to the passing of time. Ever the optimist, I want to push back on this a bit, because <laughs> I want to suggest that this is precisely why their networked, decentralized, and practice-based nature is so key. Not only does this generate a sort of collective resilience through the creation of meaning that extends beyond that moment and that local space, but it also creates and generates an adaptability and immutability. Their non-fixity is their potential, or their potencia, we could say even. Individually, yes, they are fragile and vulnerable, precarious and ephemeral, but collectively they have a potential for persistence. And that's why, again, studies like this really matter. They document that which may appear as fleeting while offering an analytical view that makes possible an understanding of their broader resonances and relations. As she says, it's a labor to traducir y crear una inteligibilidad entre esas experiencias. So what's at stake is not about recounting successes or failures, but rather about seeing and thinking with these many diverse experiments that are motivated by the desire to create a different way of being in the world. So this means engaging in those pedagogies of dissent with them. The book itself, I would say, is a practice of sorts of that pedagogy of dissent the very pedagogy of dissent that it describes and that it documents, it is producing as well. And I think that our own acts of reading and writing can be a part of that. In closing, I just wanted to say that um, in this current moment, the idea, again, as I mentioned at the beginning, this idea of pedagogies, pedag pedagogies of dissent has even greater urgency. And the work presented here has, I think, really tremendous potential to expand our thinking and our action on a collective level especially as we interrogate the meaning of connection and of relations in these current circumstances, as we struggle to imagine ways that cultural uh, production can be mobilized to create connection across distance, and as we struggle to rethink the meaning of collectivity from our experiences of physical isolation. I have a few questions to just um, put out into the world and to Patricia. Um, the first is about the idea or the concepts of autonomy and of autogestion in relation to pedagogies of dissent. There's moments where there are gestures to the con these concepts um, and also in your analysis of the photography collective supai. But I'm wondering if you could talk more about how pedagogies of dissent interacts with these concepts, right? So what that, that um, relation is. Um, you talked a lot in your opening comments about the process of editing the collection, uh, but I'm wondering also if there are any adjacent experiences that don't appear in the book, but that really helped shape your thinking about pedagogies of dissent. Also, the question of how this current coyuntura that we're living shifts or broadens your thinking about the project. Um, what are pedagogies of dissent with distancing? Uh, and then I love that the book is available online for free download. Um, but it appears on the website that it's not available for purchase. Um, so I'm curious about that, right? So it's this book that not only can you freely download it, but you, you can't even buy it if you 
want to pay money for it yet. So curious about that sort of uh, how that was negotiated and how what that what that means. And then finally, when can we read your forthcoming book on youth protest culture? Because yeah, we are all anxiously awaiting it. So thank you for the opportunity to to share and to um, read this with you. Oh, thank you, Magali. Um, so Patricia thought would you like to go ahead and answer some i also i don't want to put you on the spot alba i know at least one of the authors is here perhaps you have a few things to say and we do have in the chat forum we have a couple questions so perhaps patricia you could answer a couple of these of these fine i know they were they were great questions some large ones but if you could answer those and alba if you'd like i don't want to put you in the spot we'd love to hear from you and then i, I do want to make sure at some point i'm getting a couple set of two two really rich questions yes um well Thank you so much, Magali. I, I really appreciate um, your um, comments. Uh, you, you don't know how, <laughs> um, because um, you're, one is always insecure about, you know, am, am I saying what I really want to say? And uh, am I getting through? And, um, and um, yeah, it, it reassures me enormously. I want to say one thing first, and is that I share your optimism about the nature of these experiences, but I wanted to point at the at how um, sometimes uh, these collectives uh, feel this fragility and have a sense of failure many times when they disband or when the experience ends and the feeling is that they have failed. And uh, I've been, in all these years working with them, telling them precisely that that's, that's not it, that there is something that stays and that the effort is, is worthwhile. No? But um, the fragility also comes many times from the same field, from people who feel that they are in, in the same side, let's say, and are very critical uh, uh, amongst each other and not always in a constructive way. And so I, I wanted to sort of address that fragility as well and how they perceive it. And uh, regarding the, the other um, issues, um, you mentioned how it is important to look at the materiality of these um, things. And I think it is very much linked to the issue of autogestion and autonomy. Uh, also as part of um, a claim, no? I have, um, um, as part of my um, book on, on Peru, that I hope it should be ready next year. <laughs> Sometime I have a, a big chunk already written, but these uh, new ways of teaching are really in the way and <laughs> they are it's very time consuming, so I'm, I'm uh, slowed down. But um, part of the, the, the practices that I see as generating new sociabilities have to do with the way in which they produce uh, their art or interventions and the um, rejection, for example, of help from NGOs or from municipalities or from whoever wants to give money in exchange for some kind of control or use or the, of the work of these um, activists. And I think that's a very interesting um, affirmation of, of autonomy, but also on the economic activities uh, these generates because they support themselves doing what they do. I've learned a new verb in Peru, feriar, <laughs> el verbo feriar, which they use to get money from, from their activities based on selling the things that they produce. And there is a whole market for this production that is a solidarity market. Everybody knows why they are purchasing what they are, you know, um, getting uh, with the intent of contributing to the growth of these activities. So um, I think that the, these um, ideas of autonomia and autogestion are linked to the production of an alternative way of, of life where money has another role. No, um, I have in my, in my book a, a long section on money because it comes up in all the um, uh, interviews I've, I've done. Uh, so I've interviewed about uh, 60 people in, in that. The amazing experience was what, that there was never a point of saturation. <laughs> Every interview opened the, the, the questions even uh, to a broader expressions of this very rich and dense uh, culture that is in fact um, transnational. 
I ended up in Chile and Argentina because the people I was uh, interviewing in Peru sent me there <laughs> uh, in a way. You know? So I, I followed what they were telling me and the circulation of, of ideas, of forms of working, of the workshops that they do. I, I was uh, with an artist in, in Peru, she's a muralist um, and uh, also a, a designer. And uh, she showed me her room and she had posters from all over Latin America where she does silk screen workshops. And she has a very interesting technique working with colors and shapes, etc. And she's been traveling throughout Latin America, feriando, selling her things, getting there, sleeping in couches, etc. No, but uh, she's very active and very well known and travels all over the place uh, just by doing what she does. No? And, um, so these are some uh, um, examples and ideas that I hope um, answer your questions. And thank you again for your comments. Okay, we I have already two a couple questions. Maybe I'll pose a question, and then I know that we'll also then let Alba intervene. But first of all, uh, from Michael Lasada, muchas felicidades a Patricia por el libro y Magali por su excelente comentario. My question is, when do these new pedagogies of dissent emerge? How does the book historicize the phenomena that we are seeing in so many places, in so many spheres, and in resistance to so many forms of repression and discrimination? Um, do I answer quickly? Y yes. <laughs> because I, I started observing this in this century. Um, and I think it, it has to do uh, a lot with the um, social movements um, with the re-emergence of anarchist politics, um, issues like the squares um, movements, um, the, the values that people were presenting there, also the disenchantment of a formal um, politics um, and the need to find other ways of nurturing uh, dissidents. No? So what is amazing is how these uh, theorizations have been uh, traveling um, and enriching each other without much um, you know, cerebral discussions about this author or that other author. These are things that are also defined in practice and with constant circulation of conversation that also connectivity facilitates. That's another thing that I think is, is really interesting because you can see the debates and the threads uh, of discussions, the political discussions, very relevant, uh, very deep, but with very few words, <laughs> where, <laughs> where issues are just uh, you know, dealt with uh, and with an immediate um, reflection in, in political practice. Very urgent, everything, very urgent, <laughs> very immediate. Um, and with a very important um, uh, value for the here and now, for what is going to happen today and tomorrow, without concerning themselves much about the wider horizon, but the urgent needs of the here and now. You know? So I think that that has a, a put an, an imprint in, in the way in which ideas circulate, decisions are made, um, and I, I think that, again, the, the value of anarchist practice uh, has been really important because there is an immediate uh, link between deliberation and action. So it's very horizontal. You discuss and then you do. <laughs> no, tomorrow. <laughs> and I, I think that's quite um, um, new, but it's, it's from this century, I would say. Probably trails back earlier on, but I see it here. Magali. Could I chime in? Yeah, um, I, I absolutely agree. And I, I always say that this century for me in, in the context of these movements and resistance, this century starts in 1994 for me with the emergence of the Zapatista movement. Um, and so I always say the 21st century, but that started in 1994, because I think that that is an, uh, an undeniable influence on a hemispheric and global level. Um, and I think that it, it has everything to do with that um, sort of horizon of autonomy, whether named or unnamed um, by movements that uh, I think really connects a lot of the practice with the here and the now focus and that and that pre prefiguration that does come from anarchism. I, I consider the Zapatistas an anarchist movement. They will never name themselves that, but in their form of government, their form of, of cultural practice, et cetera, we can see all the sort of principles of anarchism in action. So, so I, I definitely appreciate that, um, that uh, 
that historicization. And I think that it's that linking of, of a, an anarchism of this century, right? That is absolutely inflected by a politics of autonomy and very significantly a feminist politics as well. Excellent. Well, the questions are rolling in and we had decided beforehand that I would read them. I know they're on chat, but it'll just make it easier for Patricia and Magali. So, um, and I also want to, your mention of artists, I did not mention in my introduction, I didn't thank Sara Clemente from Stanford University who made the lovely Afiche, the, the flyer, did a wonderful job. She, Elizabeth and, our, the, and Alberto Diaz, who uh, were really key for the support from Stanford. And Alberto asked the following question. I have a question of whether pedagogy of dissent can be sponsored by the state. I'm thinking in particular of a lot of youth violence prevention programs in the region that are often paid by state or government funding, but are quite autonomous in what they actually do on the ground. Should I answer? Or yes. Do we wait for more? Yes. Um, well, there is a, a lot of um, different experiences um, about this, and I think that the key is the connection that whatever program establishes with people and how respectful they are for what the people want to do. Uh, there are horrible failed experiences of money being thrown at yeah, que hagan graffiti los chicos, <laughs> you know, this, take them out of the streets as, as the main motivation, but not really trying to connect with them as people. And I think that the, the basis of, of these pedagogies is respect and space for the development of subjectivities. If they are prepared to do that, as it has happened in some places, the experiences are, are wonderful. But um, one thing to take into account that, that is also part of the historical scenario is uh, the pink tie. And in particular, the officialization of the uh, puntos de cultura, uh, the cultura viva comunitaria, is the continuation of the um, Pedagogía de la Liberación in Brazil. And it expands from them to different municipalities in Latin America where there were left-wing mayors. And then there is a, a way of proceeding to channel municipalities and money to promote culture. And in many cases, this has connected with very uh, historical um, movimientos barriales or particularly in, in cities, no? And it has been very, very productive and very, um, with a very important negotiation with the communities. And it hasn't happened everywhere, but it is certainly an interesting experience that, uh, as uh, Magali was saying, shows the connection with uh, uh, historical trajectories of these movements and the way in which they have appropriated cultural work to make politics. One more question that I'll make sure Alba to, to give you time, and this is from Erika Verba. I'm not sure if it's a fair question, but I'm curious about strategies you may have on how to take concepts about pedagogies of liberation to the classroom when you work for a university that is following neoliberal models. I think everyone present here would have lots to say about this, but I will leave it to Patricia and perhaps Magali wants to make a, a brief comment. Yeah, I, I think that, um, it has to do with how you relate to people always, uh, regardless of where you are. There are certainly constraints, um, but I think it's, um, it has to do with, with how you embrace these ideas as something that informed your, your practice. Um, I don't have uh, definitely a recipe, and I'm not even sure that I am all the um, uh, liberator <laughs> I would like to be, but um, I, uh, yeah, I think it is, it is difficult to respond with a recipe or something, but I think if you embrace certain principles, you're going to apply them anyway, um, in any way you can. Yeah, Magali, would you? Yeah, um, yeah, I think it's a fantastic question, one that we're definitely thinking through continually. Um, mm -hmm. One of the ways that I try to imagine that is with the, the materials that I bring into that classroom space, right? And so um, bringing things that students might not otherwise have access to, right? Um, uh, working with the kinds of 
materials highlighted, the kinds of cultural products highlighted, for example, in the contributions to this book. Um, shifting thinking about what counts as knowledge and significantly what counts as theory. That's, I think, one of the biggest interventions I try and make in the classroom is to really shake up the student's thought of, and my own about what where theory comes from and where we can see theory emerging. Um, and for me, that that's one one strategy. Um, so, you know, using different forms of media, um, folks who might not be considered to be theorists or intellectuals under sort of standard hierarchies. Uh, and then doing everything we can to extract resources and shake up those neoliberal institutions. <laughs> Great. Alba, can we ask you to intervene if you'd like? Yeah, sure. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, I guess I would just say that it was a real um, pleasure being part of this book and um, actually only reading the book after it was published but seeing the connections between the chapters. Because I, when I was carrying out this research, I was um, doing my PhD. And I remember when I was in Colombia, especially, and trying to talk to all these different graffiti artists and thinking about graffiti and how, what, how I was sort of seeing it as an important cultural product. I was coming across what I saw as obstacles where people were saying, yes, this is good because it's saying something clearly political this kind of graffiti is rubbish because it's just a scrawl or there just seem to be so many distinctions between what we can actually get from different forms of art and culture and, and to what extent we see them as being you know legitimate political acts or kind of reflections of politics and actually for me they all had an interest that whole the kind of anything that was written on the wall there was always something there to it and I was interested in how what it told us about how people thought about the world around them and so as I was reading this book I was thinking oh everyone's doing this everyone's kind of the, the focus is much less on what is the outcome of these interventions or these actions and it's much more on kind of what are the multiple and interesting ways in which people are um, being political just in terms of engaging with the world around them and trying to do something so that was one of the things that I am um, I really enjoyed about it. The other thing I just wanted to say was really in relation to um, my chapter, I was looking at this case of um, Diego Felipe, who was a graffiti artist who um, was shot and killed by the police. And it was really interesting to me that it was his parents who really um, pushed forward with this attempt to create the memorialization at the bridge and to get different graffiti artists involved and it really shifted their way of thinking about what was about the kind of the social structure and the relations with the police in the city a lot of graffiti artists had already kind of you know come across problems with the police um, and I saw it as quite a sort of standalone chapter um, it's not part of my uh, PhD thesis so much um, but then since its publication um, Colombia has seen huge protests and huge protests in relation to police violence and police abuses that are, that should, I think, be linked more to Black Lives Matter movements around the world, but reporting on which I have not seen much of in the UK, I don't know about the US, um, but it just, it, it kind of reminded me that these are amazing forms of doing politics and it's great that people are engaged in the face of kind of quite horrific situations but it's also sad to see that that chapter is still relevant and that there are still these kind of um, obstacles that people are facing these kind of violences that people have to negotiate so there is I'm always torn between the optimism of cultural activism and people doing stuff and the sort of sadness at seeing things on a large scale not changing. So just to, not to end on a pessimistic note, but I think that balance is always interesting and it is what keeps people going, I suppose, as well. But yeah, I'll leave it there. I, I want to add, a, thank you very much, Ella. That was great. And um, I want to add, I, on Facebook, I was just received a question or a little bit ago, I guess, um, someone writes, I can't be there tomorrow, but I've looked, I've, I've read the book and like it very much. 
but Gramsci is not that present. Is he no longer uh, nuestra guía espiritual between, entre comillas, of luchas sociales? I, I couldn't avoid that question. So the presence of Gramsci in the book, and is, is he not have the, the, the person who elaborates not have the theoretical weight or the, the political presence that he might have 20 years ago with new social movements? Um, I consider myself uh, very influenced by Gramsci. Um, and um, I mentioned him just to paraphrase him in, um, in a section of the introduction, but uh, really there is um, one very important uh, motivating um, thought I, I have from Gramsci when um, in the um, introduction to the philosophy of um, Benedetto Croce, um, Materialismo Historico y la Filosofía de Benedetto Croce, um, he talks about uh, uh, becoming a subject in politics as this more or less random moment in life when you can be walking by the street as a leaf just pushed by the wind and then something clicks in your head and you embrace your circumstances and understand yourself as a possible interventor in these circumstances, as the political moment when, when subjectivity emerges. <laughs> you know, and in, in a way, what is behind all these efforts um, of producing practices and subjectivities is, is this um, um, understanding that you need to be present to do something. You no know, change is only possible if, if you are present, understanding what happens around you. And the thing is how to achieve this uh, uh, dialogue between the different ways in which people may be perceiving these things and the possibility of creating a collectivity that reacts um, to these circumstances. And so um, Gramsci, his concerns in, in, on culture and on political subjectivities is, is present. Um, but if, if you read the, the introduction, uh, it's not very theoretical. It's, it's a lot of <laughs> uh, trying to put together these, these experiences and bring in uh, what I consider useful uh, to talk about these things. No? And so I, I brought in maybe things that I have read more recently, but uh, yeah, I can say that Gramsci is still in my heart and my brain. <laughs> Because that's how I started thinking about the importance of culture in, in politics. Magali, did you want to comment on that? or? Is... Okay. No, I was simply saying same. Yes. Great. Yeah, I okay. think Gramsci is there without being named. Okay, yes. excellent. Okay. Is there any final brief comments, questions? We have a couple minutes, but I know as a lot of people... Have Three or four people have said, very sorry, I have to be off at one. I know that the, the photos will start disappearing. Okay, well, I just wanna, um, first of all, I wanna remind people at the December 2nd event, the talk that'll be a similar format, the author, Lina Brito from Northwestern and the commentator, Ricardo Lopez Pedreros, and then the book is Marijuana Boom, The Rise and Fall of Colombia's First Drug Paradise. This is again, co-sponsored UC Davis and Stanford University. I want to I, I want to really thank everyone. I want to thank you know Patricia and uh, Magali for their ex excellent effort. And I want to thank everyone for being here. You've restored my faith in Zoom. I'll be very honest, very uh, <laughs> personal here. I I have I have Zoom fatigue. It's mostly it's meetings, things like that. And a couple events I've gone into Zoom. It just didn't come anywhere near sitting in a room with someone, sharing ideas, arguing, you know, complimenting. And this was great. I learned a lot. I, I really, really strongly recommend the book, and I think this forum worked well. Uh, I think that, that I was really glad to get these fantastic questions. So anyway, I just want to thank everyone so much. Uh, if you're again, the, the book is free, downloadable. You can't buy it. It's, it's only free, as Magali insisted. But again, I want to thank everyone and all the people who made this possible. Who you know, we've mentioned before, but it does. Zoom is not is not easy. There's a lot of people here. Technical help. Our beautiful Sada and the beautiful. A feature and things like that. But anyone, anyway, uh, please stay well and thank you all for joining. Thank you so much.